Good afternoon. Please let me assure you this is neither a Methodist nor Baptist event, but we have lots of room in the front row. Uh, so if you are missing a seat, there's plenty of room down in front. Uh, this in the 19th century was known as the sinner's bench, or the anxious bench. But that's another story. Uh, my name is Bill Lawrence. I'm the Dean at Perkins School of Theology, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon lecture. A tradition that began several years ago to celebrate the appointment of faculty members to endowed chairs has allowed us to celebrate that event uh, in a formal academic way as well as in other ways. And today we have the very special opportunity to hear the inaugural lecture by Dr. Brad Braxton, the Lois Craddock Perkins Professor of Preaching here at Perkins School of Theology. I am delighted to be able to introduce to you Dr. Braxton by a bit of his background. Let me start by saying he is both academically trained and pastorally called. He's an ordained Baptist minister who grew up on the East Coast, grew up in Virginia. His education included an undergraduate degree, a BA from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where his major field of study was religious studies with a minor in classics. He then was awarded a Rhodes Scholarship, and he went to the University of Oxford where his primary area of study as a Rhodes Scholar was New Testament studies, earned the Master of Philosophy degree there, and then came back home and earned the PhD at Emory University uh, as a George W. Woodruff Fellow. His primary area of study, New Testament studies, with a secondary area of homiletics. Dr. Braxton is a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He is a magna cum laude graduate and a Jefferson Scholar from the University of Virginia. When one puts on one's resume, and there are precious few of us who can do this, a combination that includes Phi Beta Kappa, Jefferson Scholar, Rhodes Scholar, and George W. Woodruff Fellow, one is entitled to dance with the angels. <laughs> Brad Braxton has already helped us appreciate how that is possible, not only academically, but homiletically. In the opportunities that we've had to hear him as a preacher in Perkins Chapel and in other settings, it's clear that he is also called of God and blessed with the gifts for preaching. That may sound like an obvious thing for a professor of homiletics, but there's been more than one theological school that has had on its faculty a professor of preaching about whom people in local churches would say, well, he may be quite a professor, but he's not much of a preacher. Uh, I assure you that is not uh, a difficulty that we have here with Dr. Braxton's appointment. Besides his accomplishments professionally, homiletically, pastorally, and academically, Brad is just an extraordinarily fine man. I have come to value the conversations we've had, uh, I've had with him and his wife, Lizetta, and their daughter, Karis, uh, and really value not only all of his academic and homiletical gifts, but also his friendship. You may be aware of his uh, professional background, but for the record, let me note simply that among his places of service before coming to Perkins School of Theology, he has been a distinguished visiting scholar at McCormick Theological Seminary, an associate professor of homiletics and New Testament at Vanderbilt Divinity School. He was theologian in residence for a mission study trip to Ghana and uh, South Africa. He's been the Jesse Ball DuPont Professor of Homiletics and Biblical Studies at Wake Forest University has been a pastor at Douglas Memorial Church in Baltimore and senior minister at the Riverside Church in New York City. His full-time responsibilities here at Perkins School of Theology as the Lois Craddock Perkins Professor of Homiletics have not deterred him from his ecclesiastical duties. 
Indeed, he is starting a new church, the Open Church in Baltimore, Maryland, about which we may very well hear some things as he delivers his lecture today. Dr. Braxton is going to speak to us on the title, Aiding and Abetting New Life, Sex Talk in the Pulpit, Pew, and Public Square. Sisters and brothers, please join me in welcoming our honored lecturer, Dr. Brad Braxton. proverb that says, where there is no music, the spirit will not come. In order to provide the most hospitable environment for the spirit of God, which searches the deep places of God, join me in singing ever so sweetly a chorus of hallelujah. horsepower is matched by an equally significant commitment to faithful discipleship. Even in these few short months of being in your midst, my life has been wonderfully enriched. Lizetta and Karis send their greetings, and I am strengthened by their prayers. Also, Mr. Marco Merrick, the chair of the trustee ministry at the Open Church in Baltimore sends his regards on behalf of our entire congregation. And he asked me to express the congregation's profound gratitude for the partnership between the Open Church and the Perkins School of Theology. 
While African American churches are my principal focus in this lecture, there are also insights here, I pray, that can inform and enhance the ongoing pastoral and homiletic practices of other Christian communities across the United States and around the globe. I begin with a quotation from the lesbian minister and homiletics professor, Christine Smith. Christianity is about forming a people who take seriously resurrection in their everyday lives and move their bodies and lives into places where their embodied power can make a difference. Whenever the power of death cannot silence the power of life, I believe we are standing in the presence of resurrection. The title of my lecture is Aiding and Abetting New Life. Sex Talk in the Pulpit Pew and Public Square. African American churches have been incubators of life in deadly circumstances. However, concerning sexuality, many African American churches create hostile environments, especially for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons. Congregational leaders, scholars, and activists must encourage these congregations to stop unholy character assassinations and to aid and abet new life among sexually diverse people. This lecture is designed to move us toward two practical goals in African American congregations and the larger society. Number one, healthier conversations about sexuality. And number two, greater affirmation for and inclusion of LGBT persons. Speaking of inclusion, let's begin with a discussion of an inclusive gospel. The kingdom of God, God's beloved community, where social differences no longer divide and access to God's abundance is equal was the primary theme of Jesus' ministry. Jesus desired loving communities that would serve as a foretaste of the coming commonwealth of God. When Christians exclude people based on social identity, we defame the character of Jesus whose primary impulse was inclusion. The late theologian and preacher, Peter Gomes, observed, and I quote, If Jesus Christ is the center of the biblical witness, how do we reconcile his expansive and inclusive behavior as recorded in scripture with what has so often been the constricted and exclusive practice of the church. Jesus' generosity and hospitality got him into terrible trouble. End quote. Christians should model reconciling inclusive love Jesus describes the gospel this way. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life is the heart of the gospel. However, by promoting patriarchal perspectives on gender, and puritanical perspectives on sexuality, some African-American congregations steal the peace, kill the joy, and destroy the hope of many women, 
LGBT persons, and people advocating for their empowerment. Congregations should aid and abet God's bestowal of life upon all who seek better ways to become better people for the sake of a better world. In Luke 14, Jesus encouraged his followers to go into the streets and lanes of the town with an inclusive invitation to God's party so that God's house would be filled. In the spirit of Jesus' teaching, Congregations should be holy house parties where mm. hospitality is abundant and the sacredness of diverse forms of covenant love and sanctified sexuality are celebrated. As a heterosexual ally with LGBT persons, I raise this question. How do we take an inclusive gospel to the streets. If the goal is to sponsor real change in congregations, our pastoral theology must keep it real. <laughs> the late pastor and ethicist Samuel DeWitt Proctor remarked, and I quote, Theology never comes alive in abstract debate. It is best understood when it is lived. A good pastor will take the time to show the people how life should be lived. The pastor recognizes that life must be lived in very pedestrian ways and that people who are lacking in sophistication need teaching at the street level. Not everyone needs such help, but the pastor must always be ready to give it. End quote. Reaching African American congregations at the street level with progressive understandings of sexuality will require, number one, relevant styles of communication, or what I call keeping it real. And number two, emphasizing the importance of relationships, or what I call keeping it relational. A discussion of each point follows. Keeping it real. Many forms of African American communication involve body talk. <laughs> the homiletician Teresa Fry Brown highlights the prevalence of African American sister speak which is informal, no pretense, at home, dangling participles, double negative, tell it like it T-I is, <laughs> intense body language speech. <laughs> These forms of communication are also found among many African American brothers. The stereotype of embodied African-American communication. Head swerving, hand moving, body swaying is anchored in some truth. The anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston referred to these dramatic, fleshly, even sexualized forms of communication as the characteristics of Negro expression. Hurston wrote, and I quote, every phase of Negro life is highly dramatized. Everything is acted out, end quote. 
body talk is a major strand of African-American cultural DNA. Body talk must also help us to realize that as it relates to the inclusion of LGBT persons, bodies are on the line. Real bodies. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and heterosexual bodies all constituting the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. The homiletician Martha Simmons insists that if religious leaders are going to take an inclusive gospel to the streets, they must mix James Brown with James Cone. Mm. <laughs> James Cone is the revered father of black liberation theology. Yet to fully activate an inclusive gospel of liberation, we need the communication of James Brown, the godfather of soul, whose unshackled bodily movements conveyed freedom and truth at a level deeper than pure rationality. The transformation of sexual attitudes and values will require more than scholarly argumentation. Practical teaching methods that illustrate deep truths also will be necessary. An example of keeping it real is instructive. I served for five years as the senior pastor of Douglas Memorial Community Church, a socially engaged African-American congregation in Baltimore, Maryland. Once during a sermon series on relationships, I preached a sermon entitled Sanctified Sexuality. The pastoral aims were to depict sexuality as our sacred desire for emotional and physical intimacy and promote approaches to sexual expression that glorify God and the community. The sermon could have begun with a dry rehearsal of theories about sexuality. But a sermon about sexuality needed some sex appeal. <laughs> so my wife had a small cordless microphone attached to her dress as she sat in the congregation. The sermon began with the two of us reading passionately to each other erotic love poetry from the biblical book, Song of Songs. While we were spatially distant from one another, our voices caressed and revealed to congregants that on other occasions, more than just our voices had caressed. <laughs> Eavesdropping on this erotic dialogue, one female parishioner started fanning herself. <laughs> with the worship bullet. <laughs> Perhaps she was having a hot flash, recalling a hot time from yesteryear, or maybe yesterday. <laughs> Like good foreplay, this dramatic sermon introduction opened minds and lubricated hearts so that people could interact more intimately with their sexual existence. Keeping it 
relational. Street level teaching also will emphasize the development of godly relationships amid social diversity. Enabling constructive encounters with diversity is a primary pastoral task of congregations. Pastoral care ultimately is the responsibility of an entire congregation and not a duty to be fulfilled exclusively by clergy. Clergy facilitate the ministry of care through example and instruction. However, presenting God's multifaceted love requires a multiplicity of voices. Mm. Apart from diversity, the practice of love becomes egotistical self-adoration. By welcoming diversity in the embodied presence of others, in this case LGBT persons, congregations enhance their capacity to offer love, or should I say, make love. Yes, the pastoral task of making love requires an affirmation of diversity. The phrase, making love, should not be reduced exclusively to erotic activity. Making love is the mission of the church. The Apostle Paul's beautiful love hymn reminds the church of its love-making mandate if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love never ends. This hymn entices believers to embrace genuine love the compassionate concern for others that transcends sheer self-interest and removes the fear of people who differ from us. Imagine how much more careful Christian congregations would be if they caressed people with Paul's gracious words about love in 1 Corinthians 13, instead of battering them with Paul's ungenerous words about gay and lesbian persons in Romans 1. Furthermore, our neglect of another biblical love note has diminished our love life. 1 John 418 declares, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Diversity is crucial for making love. Consequently, there is no more pressing pastoral task than teaching people how to encounter diversity without the fear and fanaticism that terminate dialogue and destroy difference. While academic study facilitated my journey toward inclusive theology, the decisive moments in my pilgrimage involved friendships without LGBT persons who challenged and expanded my theological and cultural boundaries. Warm relationships, not cold logic, transformed me. For example, at the covenant ceremony of two lesbian friends in Atlanta in 1996, the presence of grace and holiness in that ceremony and later at their dinner table was undeniable. Additionally, during my first pastorate in Baltimore, 
a gay friend and parishioner, accepted my invitation to direct a new church choir. His anointed leadership and winsome personality transformed the congregation's worship life and community outreach. Witnessing his powerful ministry, I realized that right heart orientation, not straight sexual orientation, is God's requirement for service in the church. And this brother's heart was rightly oriented toward God. At the intersection of relationships, I made a U-turn and set my face toward inclusion. Human transformation has mysterious dimensions that transcend theoretical analysis and rationality. Stories go sometimes where statistics can't. People can easily ignore facts, but human faces are not so easily dismissed. Faces are doorways to people's hearts. The adoption of more inclusive approaches will entail more than a mind game. It will require heart transplants. Not on operating tables, but around fellowship tables as sexually diverse friends recognize the face of God in each other. Many African Americans know the painful realities of racial politics, where certain white people welcome African Americans as long as they reject or mute their cultural identity markers. In the face of this dehumanizing racism, James Brown declared these defiant lyrics. Say it loud. I'm black, and I'm proud. The disruption of racism requires more than just black bodies. It requires proud black bodies. Similarly, the disruption of dehumanizing homophobia requires more than the quiet presence of LGBT bodies. It, too, requires proud LGBT bodies. God's inclusive love calls LGBT persons to offer a creative remix. Say it loud, I'm LGBT, and I'm proud. Courage and compassion needed for congregations to hear, face, and embrace this kind of diversity will surely make Jesus proud as well. Having established a broad theological framework, I now want to speak more specifically about the task of preaching. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. This cute proverb cannot hide the ugly truth. Words can hurt. Linguistic lacerations can inflict wounds on the psyche that linger longer than any physical fracture. Thankfully, however, words also can heal. For example, gracious, thoughtful sermons are acts of rhetorical hospitality. Through the creative use of language, sermons provide God a hospitable place to meet with and transform listeners. As a professor of preaching, words are my world. Thus, my question is, how might African-American Christian preaching advance inclusive theologies of sexuality? A brief discussion of two features of African-American preaching. Number one, the preacher's authority. 
And number two, the preacher's style will facilitate answers to this question. Typically, African American churches grant preachers a generous amount of authority. This authority consists of a communally derived sanction for preachers to speak on behalf of the congregation to the external powers that be. African American congregations also expect their preachers to speak boldly to the congregation itself. Since authority comes through the congregation, humility in the preacher is appropriate. Yet most African American congregations have no tolerance for timidity in the pulpit. Hmm. The preacher must wed a silver tongue to nerves of steel, taking parishioners to theological depths and heights they would not otherwise experience. Philosophically, the authority given to African American preachers reflects the primacy of the spoken word in many African rhetorical traditions. Certain African traditions emphasize nomo, N-O-M-M-O, -M -M -O, nomo. Nomo, an African concept, conveys the general and sustaining powers of the spoken word, powers that permeate every department of life. Because of nomo, vocal expression reigns supreme in most African cultures. Since the preacher is the agent and embodiment of nomo for many African American Christians, nomo is conveyed to the community through the preacher's presence and the preacher's words. The authority of the preacher is a rhetorical umbilical cord connecting African American ministers with Mother Africa. Second. African American Christians believe that style is a central component of preaching. Distinctive aspects of sermon delivery, gestures, tone of voice, rate of speech, picturesque language are channels for nomo and the gospel. Unless the gospel is engaging, it is hardly heard much less remembered. <laughs> Style is the preacher's antidote against sermonic amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> the inability of congregants to remember a sermon shortly after it is preached. In light of these two features of African American preaching, let us now explore briefly the ethics of preaching and the potential of imaginative preaching to sponsor healthier conversations about and progressive theologies of sexuality. The ethics of preaching. The considerable authority enjoyed by many African American ministers should motivate them to achieve the highest standards of speech ethics. Since African American Christians rever revere sacred speech no more, the pulpit microphone is arguably the most significant and potentially dangerous symbol of human power in congregations. Mm. An open mic should never be open season for preachers to take aim at persons with hatred and sarcasm, especially when addressing the mysteries of sexuality. For example, the crass phrase, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, is undignified language unfit for any pulpit. Instead, care and compassion should characterize all sermons, 
regardless of preacher's theological perspectives. The Bible is very concerned about the ethics of how Christians communicate. For example, the book of James warns believers, and especially leaders, about the lethal consequences of an unholy tongue. James chapter 3 insists, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strength. The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire and is itself set on fire by hell. On those rare occasions when sexuality is addressed, too many sermons fuss about the sinful use of genitals, even as those sermons ironically ignore the sinful use of the tongue. The body part often injuring the body of Christ through callous discussions of sexuality. Jesus never condemned LGBT persons. He, however, was explicit about God's intolerance for careless speaking. Listen to Matthew 12, 36 and 37. On the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. In light of Jesus' admonition, I present a sobering reminder to fledgling ministers in my preaching courses in seminary. There is, I tell them, a heavenly stenographer assigned to every preacher who records every word that comes from your mouth in the pulpit. At God's judgment bar, you will have to answer for every time you opened your mouth to bless or curse someone. Many professions such as medicine, law, and business regulate the ethics of their practitioners. A failure to abide by the code of ethics can result in the loss of a license or disbarment. Hmm. Preachers one day will stand before the ultimate chief justice in heaven's high court. It would be tragic for any minister to be disbarred on judgment day for reckless endangerment with a lethal weapon, <laughs> the tongue, and first degree homiletic homicide with an unconcealed microphone. Ah. <laughs> the emphasis on style should empower African American ministers to preach about sexuality with greater imagination. Sermons can facilitate constructive dialogue when preachers are poets and spoken word artists. Mm. Poetic preaching can supply compelling images that exemplify the breadth of diverse forms of sanctified sexuality. Jesus is an excellent tutor for homiletic creativity. Jesus did not avoid sensitive, controversial subjects. He sometimes approached issues directly. However, on many occasions, Jesus' homiletic purposes were better served by the poetic indirection of parables. Short stories with common elements that led to uncommon meanings. The pastor and theologian, Eugene Peterson, discusses the subversive nature of parables. He writes, and I quote, Parables sound absolutely ordinary. Casual stories about soil and seeds, meals and coins and sheep, bandits and victims, 
farmers and merchants. As people heard Jesus tell these stories, they relaxed their defenses. They walked away perplexed, wondering what they meant. The stories lodged in their imagination. And then, like a time bomb, they would explode in their unprotected hearts. Parables aren't illustrations that make things easier. They make things harder by requiring the exercise of our imaginations. End quote. Preachers should imitate Jesus' creative style when seeking to promote healthier dialogue concerning sexuality, especially given the discomfort and defensiveness caused by sexual topics. I offer two examples. First, during a recent sermon about social justice engagement in a Christian congregation, I inserted this sentence. Let this be a house where heterosexual Christian men and gay Christian men can peacefully break bread even as they break down stereotypes. This sentence appeared to create a perceptible shift in the spiritual energy in the sanctuary. It was as if some congregants were asking, did he just put the words gay and Christian in the same sentence? Maybe others were envisioning diverse groups of men engaged in peaceful dialogue, a promising image in light of the epidemic of violence sending so many African American men to cemeteries. Still others might have considered the reference about breaking bread as an invitation to think about holy communion and its implications for genuine hospitality. Like a poem or a parable, that simple sentence was designed to imply all that and hopefully more. Amid a sermon of more than 2,000 words. I smuggled in 23 words to explode preconceived assumptions about the boundaries of the church. It was not a frontal attack on exclusion, but instead guerrilla warfare <laughs> for an inclusive gospel. <clears throat> A second example involves my presiding at Holy Communion. The biblical scholar Margaret Amer helped me several years ago to recognize the profound theological connections between the symbolic blood at Holy Communion and the blood issues affecting millions through HIV AIDS. Now, at the open church and everywhere I go when inviting persons to the Lord's table, I remind them that the body of Christ has AIDS. Therefore, if they, if we drink the blood of Jesus, they, we too, will have AIDS. I tell them, do not come to the table today unless you are willing to have AIDS. This imaginative demonstration of the words of invitation is designed to create compassion and solidarity with those infected by the disease, a disease that is spread frequently, though not exclusively, through heterosexual activity. Jesus' broken body becomes an instrument for further reflection and action concerning our sexualized body. The table in the church house and the beds in our houses are connected. It is my hope that when Christian congregations come before God on the day of judgment, 
God will find irrefutable evidence that they aided and abetted new life. Based on that conviction, I pray that the great judge will mercifully toss out other offenses and sentence us to life eternal. Questions, comments, or major readjustments <laughs> on what it is I have attempted to share. Yes, please. I most appreciate your comments and your being an ally. So I've worked for Gay and Lesbian Civil Rights in Dallas for 35 years. Yeah. So one of the things that I think, and, I, and I'm sort of wondering, so it's interesting to think about, you know, sort of keeping it real. And what's really real in Dallas right now is that HIV data for black men is the same now as it was in the 1980s. So there's been a spike and nothing's happened. So what I'm wondering is if you have ideas how the black church in Dallas could become a vehicle for education. Um, I worked on that idea initiative of a faith-based initiative to address HIV here. It's been done in other communities but it, it wasn't successful. And I worried that a piece of its unsuccessfulness was that I was a white man trying to have an, an openly gay white man, trying to have the conversation. So I'm wondering that part of me wants to charge you, you know, with this as a way to help um, brothers here in Dallas, Texas. Yes. Thank you for those observations and uh, for the challenge for us to think more practically about how to address something that is significantly impacting the wellness, if I may say it that way, of the body of Christ. Let me frame it in this way. I think first what needs to happen at the ecclesial level is there needs to be a significant reframing of our doctrines of salvation. We have a soteriology that is just far too doggone of the worldly. I want to know about a salvation that keeps people whole here, right now. And anything that impacts that wholeness must be dealt with and included in our broader conversations of salvation. So that fundamentally, one of the things congregations can do as they are teaching people about salvation, bring it down about 40,000 feet to the level of anything that makes for your wellness is salvation, and anything that doesn't, to use traditional Christian language, could be constituted as sin. That then gives you the broader canopy across a preaching program for a year, or in your Bible study, or working with the young people in your congregation, to take large sections 
of our lives. Maybe in one instance it is, my wife is a certified financial planner. So maybe in one moment it is the kinds of economic mistakes and missteps that are causing so much dis-ease in the body of Christ. Maybe another swath of the church year, you have real serious conversations on sexualized lives, what it means for us to live embodied lives. And maybe those sermons are the ones where you have sermon talkbacks and where you actually empower some of the best theologians in our congregations. Those are the folks probably from the ages of 5 to 18 <laughs> to provide significant leadership for how the liturgy is shaped, how the sermon is developed, and how the talkback occurs. You'd be surprised. We'd be surprised how much real knowledge we would gain if we let those younger voices tell us what it is they're thinking and feeling and experiencing in, in their lives. So a broader canopy of salvation, a sponsored preaching program that deals with these on-the-ground realities. And then, let me be true to what I'm saying, once you put that in place, um, I would suggest that if you're going to really keep it real, there needs to be a sensitive, thoughtful conversation about congregations distributing condoms. Yes? We've had that conversation. It was interesting because they, what you learn is that you, can, you can't talk about condoms, but you can be in an educational event, and you can have a bucket of condoms there, and they'll all be, they'll all be you, gone. You see, so there's a disconnect between the needs and our actual life and the theology. So if we could hook the theology. So if you're talking about salvation being that which makes my life well, whole, and yet you won't provide access to broader theologies and attitudes, practices, mechanisms for me to not die prematurely, then I don't need your theology. And then one more, just that this is part of this. Have you then sort of in your work sorted out what's propelling homophobia in the black church and what might distinguish homophobia in the black church from what propels homophobia in the white church? <laughs> no, no, this is, this is wonderful. In fact, I just did an interview. We were really delighted at the Open Church. Um, you know, I've been very involved in the marriage equality uh, debate. We hope that in our uh, ballot in Maryland, it's question six, that uh, marriage equality, the Civil Marriage Protection Act, which is already legislation, will survive past the referendum that was uh, raised, unfortunately, by many clergy uh, against it. And in the process of that, I had an interview a couple weeks ago with PBS, and in that conversation, I tried in a very similar way in about two to three minutes to kind of disentangle this. And let me start by saying, um, Professor Abraham Smith really helped me in an essay that he wrote uh, several years ago, and, and other scholars have helped me to kind of think my way through this. And I think, fundamentally, I would argue that the particular strand of homophobia, and I want to be careful here because you know, I don't want to go through this whole thing of vilifying black folks, right? The problem is always black folks. And you know, the white church and a whole lot of other churches got a whole lot of issues, as you've rightly pointed out. So I appreciate how you frame that. But in, in black churches, in that context, we actually must go all the way back to the plantation. And part of the problem, Professor Smith, and Robert Franklin and his book, Crisis in the Village, have done some good work on not only the material history, the actual things that happened on these plantations, but the attitudes and associations around sexualized violence are so deep in the psyche. Now, let me really, I'm talking about making it, making it really clear. Let me tell you the ways it's been experienced in my own ministry. As a preaching professor, in places. The way this has manifested itself is when you walk into a, a room as a preaching professor, especially when you are attending, you know, and people know you're going to be around for a minute, right? And, and you probably <laughs> see, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with myself. There are a lot of things I don't do well, and I'm very honest about that. There are a few things I do well, so I don't, I don't have any feigned humility when I walk into classrooms. I don't play that game. Right? I know what I'm doing, and I walk in with that kind of authority. And it's been fascinating. In, in one place where I taught previously, there was a discourse in the beginning, um, and, it, and it, it was sponsored most 
by the younger white women. And it was fascinating because white students in general, particularly younger white women, had never been in a space with the kind of authority that a black man had. And that actually discourse emerged in the community because it tapped deeply into sexualized notions of the uncontrollable black buck. It was some deep psyche things going on there. Oh my God. What happens if you let a black man free in the community? And don't fool yourself if you don't think that has not, I speak not politically, I do not editorialize, if you don't think that has shaped President Obama's way in the world. Again, I do not speak in a partisan way. I'm just telling you the fact. This stuff is deep. I will never forget when I went to the slave castles in Ghana, the material history of how the castles were designed so that the governors could look down on the black slaves and just pick any woman he wanted to rape her. This stuff is deep in the psyche. And American culture has never really wrestled with that. And the reason why in lynchings, genitals, were the, all of that stuff then gets into the system. It's in, in the cultural DNA. And it has sponsored dysfunctional conversations among many racial and ethnic communities. So we got to go back several hundred years if we want to have a serious conversation about this. So I hope you can appreciate it. It's very complex, but I think that's one of the nerve centers that must be dealt with. And that's why all of this nonsense a few years ago about a post-racial society was a lie from the pit of hell. And these notions of sexual identity, power, domination, all of this is so intertwined and it needs to be disentangled for us to go forward. Thank you. classroom on day one and throw the Bible down and say this is not inherently the word of God. <laughs> and they break out oil, they get in prayer circles, they start, you know, this is not the word of God. It has the potential to become the word of God as it is read faithfully through God's spirit in community. So, you know, it's a little easier to do that in a seminary classroom where you're presupposing certain background knowledge. But a move like that must be made, I think, in African-American congregations. And knowing this tradition and having been a real architect of the African-American hermeneutic for us, you know so well that there has always been this kind of jazz hermeneutic. And that's the way I, I talk about it in public because I think people can get their minds around it. There's always been an appreciation for the improvisational riff above the melody. Black folks have always done that. And as we know, um, our colleague, Professor Vincent Wimbush, in a very fine little book, The African Americans and the Bible, it's about 90 pages, which I think every Sunday school class, irrespective of ethnicity, should read. And in this little 90-page book, he traces the engagements with the Bible that Africans had. And one of the points he makes when I teach in African-American settings, I say, you know, Professor Wimbush says, when 
when the colonizers, when the slavers came to the continent, and they said they had God in a book, <laughs> the Africans looked at those white people and said, what? <laughs> Have you lost your mind? How you gonna put God in a book? That don't make no sense. God is out there. God is in the bubbling rivers. God is in the beauty of our experiences. God is in childbirth. God is in the way we tenderly lay to rest our elders. That's God. God in a book. And the strange cycle right, of how we went from rejecting that to now entombing God in a book. So first, we must help people to know, to create space between the Bible and the Word of God. And I say the good book sometimes does not contain the good news. Mm. Got to make that distinction, number one. And then second, in an educational way, we must let folk know that we have a very complex jazz engagement with this text. And then when I get real hard liners, I mean, they really push me, because you know, sometimes black preachers can really start pontificating. You know, but Doc, we just the word of God, Doc. We got to stand on the word, Doc. And then I simply say, Jesus says something about it being better to be eunuchs for the sake of the reign of God. And the line for castration typically is quite short. Hmm. <laughs> That's how you deal with real literalists, you know, <laughs> on the issue. I talk about keeping it real, right? That's, just, that's real. <laughs> so there's an educational process. And what I, let me say this finally, uh, the way I like to say it, and that resonates most for me, and this really sponsors the work we're doing at the Open Church. So I have a wonderfully um, permissive and expansive congregation. They, they, they tolerate a lot of nonsense from their past. Love covers a multitude of phones and names. For some reason, they keep loving me. So a few weeks ago, I had people come to me and they say, you know, I, I doing all this marriage equality stuff. I, I think I'm really with you, Pastor, but, but the Bible. So even when planting a progressive congregation, and they know, I mean, I am as far left of center as you can be and still be Christian. I mean, I teeter depending on the day on universal, you know, Unitarian. I mean, I, you know, I, it just depends, right? And I, you know, it's the way I like to talk about it, and I say this to them, I have a deep belief in God, but I'm an ecclesial atheist, right? Some days I don't know that I believe in the church even though I'm pastoring a church. So y'all pray for me, okay? I mean, so I'm on the edge. And so even in that kind of community, that radical progressive community that we're trying to create, the doggone Bible keeps cropping up. <laughs> so here's the way I did it. Talk about keeping it real. So a couple Sundays ago, when the weather was still warm, I made sure I had on a little kind of a short sleeve mock shirt so that you could really get the effect of this. And then after the song of preparation, I took bungee cords. And I took the tightest little bungee cord I could find and wrapped it around my neck. I then took one and wrapped it around my feet and then one around my hands. And then as I was bound in chains, I had one of our vocal professors stand up and sing, Oh freedom, oh freedom over me. And began to and talk about it must have been like this as the colonizers waved their Bibles and talked about their Jesus. If you've ever been in the slave castles, you know that the chapel was right above the male slave dungeon. So while folk were talking about amazing grace, there was amazing degradation in the basement. And then I asked our daughter Caris to run. I said, cars represents the future. But we can't run after the future because our feet are bound. Mm -hmm. And then I went to one of the key leaders in our congregation, who's a white lesbian woman, and I said, one of the reasons we can't love broadly is because our hands are in bondage to the Bible. <laughs> and one of the reasons we can't speak clearly is because our throat is in bondage to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then I took off each one of them, slammed them on the ground, and said, to hell with the Bible, or at least oppressive interpretations. 
So that's the kind of crazy stuff I'm up there doing. They may send me packing here for good full time after a while. But again, keeping it in that notion of hearing the songs of freedom being sung at the same time of the material history that was so much a part of our bondage. And you gonna tell me now that you want to restrict the rights of another group and claim that you have a copyright on civil rights? No, not on my watch you won't. So it's at all of those levels that I think we need to speak to create that jazz harmony again. Yes. Friends, would you join me?